Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. The United States is weeks away from electing the next president. Most polls are predicting a close race between Democrat nominee Kamala Harris and her Republican rival and former President Donald Trump, especially in the seven swing states. Ahead of the crucial election, the Federal Reserve cut its key interest rates for the first time in over four years in September. Fed uh, Chair Powell said the US economy is in good shape and the central bank wants to keep it there. But what will the election outcome mean for the US economic growth and which candidate could have a positive impact on the economy and also ties with India? To discuss this and more, we are now joined by American economist and Nobel laureate Paul Krugman. Mr. Krugman, thank you very much for being with us. At this point, who do you think has a better chance of winning the American election? Is it going to be Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? Uh, I have no idea. Um, the secret is that nobody has any idea. This is, it's a coin flip given, uh, you know, we, we don't, we have no idea what's going to happen. Of course. Uh, let me uh, begin by also asking you about Donald Trump. You've recently written that his economic policies and policies towards tariffs may lead to higher inflation. How do you think a Trump presidency would impact the U.S. economy? Oh, I mean, you, you, Trump 2.0 is very different from Trump 1.0. You know, the first time he put on a few tariffs and actually basically did nothing much else. It was pretty much orthodox Republican policy. This time he is pretty credibly promising to do really radical stuff. Um, tariffs uh, at their highest level in 90 years, uh, mass deportation, uh, something like uh, at certainly more than 5% of the U.S. workforce, um, uh, ending Federal Reserve independence. So uh, a, Trump, uh, a Trump victory would probably mean a surely much more inflationary than the policies we've seen or the policies that Harris has followed, probably a, a severe hit to U.S. economic growth, and definitely a lot of disruption of the global economy. Right. Uh, when you look at uh, Kamala Harris' presidency, why do you think currently the, the gap between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump is really narrow? If you go down to some of the swing states, she just has a two or three point lead as a maximum. Uh, why do you think uh, this Donald Tr Trump still continues to have that edge in the U.S. election? Well, we don't actually... I mean, polling has become very difficult. So I'm not sure that we even know whether the polls are right. The polls have been wrong um, substantially. I mean, that happens, but it, there may be particular problems with that now. So if, if it's really that tight, we don't know that. Um, but also, you know, most people don't pay real close attention to, uh, to policy proposals. Most people probably have no idea what Trump is proposing on tariffs. They have no idea what Harris is proposing on changes to Medicare. Um, they kind of remember that, you know, they, they've noticed that things are more expensive than they were a few years ago. Uh, they may not be fully aware that that was a one-time jump in prices, that inflation is back to normal levels now. Um, they kind of remember that things felt pretty good in 2019. And so uh, it's just, I think if people really sat down with the policy proposals, it wouldn't be close. But, you know, people have lives to live and children to raise, so they don't know. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, you have recently said that the economic policies of Joe Biden have really worked. And you've been really happy with the recent numbers coming out of the U.S. economy. If Kamala Harris were to win, what do you think is the number one task that she would have in hand as far as the U.S. economy goes? Well, the U.S. economy in, in aggregate is doing pretty well. I mean, we're basically back at target inflation. We have more or less full employment. Uh, no hint really of a, of, of a, you know, recessions can always happen, but there's not one visible in the data right now. Uh, mostly... Uh, her priorities, I think, would be for the places that the U.S. social safety net doesn't reach. So more aid for children, more aid for child care, and a recent proposal, more aid for home care for, for seniors. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's good stuff to make a 
difference to lives of millions of people, but probably not any fundamental course correction. All right, so you don't expect any fundamental course correction that is needed. Uh, if I were to ask you about the number one challenge uh, for the U.S. economy in the coming months, what would that be? Well, okay, we're, I mean, inflation does look beaten. Uh, we are waiting to see whether, I mean, we've had this period of extremely high interest rates, which kind of miraculously have not produced uh, a sharp slowdown. And we're still waiting. Is there another shoe waiting to drop? So I, I do, uh, you know, I, at this point, the, the high frequency data, the stuff that might give you an early warning, um, is all over the place. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but I am nervous that we might have a, uh, a kind of, you know, as, as people say, a wily e. coyote moment when you walk off the cliff and uh, that there might still be something uh, waiting to happen. But that's mostly it. I mean, on, by the by, the standard metrics, the U.S. economy looks just fine right now. Right. Uh, looking at uh, the. Fed decision recently, the US Fed had cut rates by 50 basis point in September. What is your expectation on the pace of cuts going forward? Okay, my guess is that they will be going, that they will not stop cutting rates because the inflation, you know, they they raised rates to fight a war on inflation and they won the war. And uh, that means that uh, normalization is the policy of choice, but probably smaller cuts unless we see some serious signs of an economic slowdown. So probably a series of 25 basis point cuts, maybe an occasional skipped cut, uh, depending upon how the economy is doing. I don't think, I think they needed to send a signal that, yeah, we, we think that this thing is, we, we think that we won this thing on inflation and we are watchful about a slowdown, but I, I don't see anything out there that would lead to more jumbo cuts. No more big cuts uh, coming from uh, the Fed. Uh, in terms of the U.S. election, if we were to talk about uh, the economy, about jobs, uh, what do you think is the number one issue that could be a deciding factor in the U.S. election, which you are watching out for? Oh, I mean, I think basically it's baked in, right? There, there, there will be one more uh, jobs report, but it will be... Uh, uh, too late. I think you know, lots of people are voting has already begun. And in any case, we know that this one is going to be the next one is going to be distorted by hurricane effects and so on. So there's nothing really there. Uh, we have some inflation reports coming up. Uh, I guess just one more that that uh, but uh, I don't think that most people even know what the personal consumption expenditures deflator is. So I don't think that's going to, I, you know, where, where we are is that the economy looks pretty good objectively. Lots of people say that they don't think it's good. Uh, but also a lot of the many, not all polls, many polls show the candidates more or less tied on the economy. Uh, it's no longer a big advantage for Trump. So I think the economy has, you know, that that's, that that's uh, that's a concluded story, and the, this election is going to turn on perceptions of of the candidate's character. When you mean perceptions of the candidate's character, what do you think uh, will be a decider? God knows, right? Is the basic answer. But uh, look, we just saw Harris walk into the lion's den to a, a hostile interview. Uh, on Fox News, and she ended up basically, it wasn't billed as a debate, but she won it anyway. Uh, we're seeing Trump, you know, it, it's becoming, incre it, his his uh, coherence seems to be visibly uh, degenerating, you know, week by week. It's not that, not just who he always was. He really, uh, he is not the candidate he was in past elections. Um, how much of that filters through to the public? is going to be, I think, the in many ways, the deciding issue. Are people going to look and say, my God, uh, you know, he's, he's not going, he's canceling out on interviews. He um, is, if you actually listen to what he says, it's gibberish. But I don't know if people really notice that. Hmm. Uh, I would also like to ask you about uh, China. We have seen a, a trade war that was triggered by Donald Trump against China. 
Biden, in a way, continued with uh, those tariff policies vis-a-vis -vis China. How do you think uh, U.S.-China relations are going to pan out? Uh, there are certain product lines like electric vehicles where Biden has imposed 100% tariffs. Uh, do you expect this tariff war with China to worsen, irrespective of who's in power? Well, it's going to be a big difference depending on who does it. The, in some ways, Biden and now Harris are more confrontational with China than Trump was. I mean, Trump had these scattershot tariffs across the board and then kind of relented on stuff because China was ready to buy some soybeans. Um, the Biden-Harris team is dead serious about trying to deny China access to advanced technologies, trying to make sure that the U.S. is uh, not dependent on China for strategically important stuff. So uh, we actually have what amounts to a, an economic cold war uh, with China that has taken place since Trump left, that has taken place under Biden and will continue under Harris. So the, there, you know, the, the idea that we're going to have a grand reconciliation seems extremely unlikely. The, the question is whether it's going to be a sort of targeted strategic confrontation with China if Harris wins or whatever it is that Trump's going to do. Right. We've also seen data coming out of uh, the Chinese economy. 4.6% GDP growth, the slowest pace of growth since last year. Uh, stimulus packages are being announced by the Chinese uh, government. How do you think the slow growth of the Chinese economy is going to impact the world? Oh, China is... It, it, it's, it's kind of one of the wonders of the world that China refuses to do the obvious thing. What China suffers from is inadequate consumer demand. They just have a, an economy that is geared towards producing and doesn't give people enough purchasing power to buy what it produces. Um, and they seem to be weirdly averse to actually addressing that. When, even when they do stimulus, it seems to be mostly aimed at enhancing productive capacity. And then the only way to reconcile that is to run massive trade surpluses, which the world is not going to accept. The Chinese leadership just doesn't seem to grasp that neither the US nor the EU, uh, which is the, the two big players, are going to accept China trying to export its way out of its economic difficulties. So this is, this is a, a recipe, among other things, for a lot more trade confrontation. I don't understand what it is with, with Xi and why the Chinese cannot bring themselves to just do a sort of a straightforward stimulus program uh, as opposed to these uh, kind of backdoor credit channel things that they seem addicted to. Uh, Mr. Krugman, how, how bullish are you on India at this juncture? According to SNP, and this is the latest report, that India is set to be the third largest economy by 2030. What do you think is going for India right now? Any concerns that you have? Well, you always worry. And India still has problems with infrastructure, has problems with education levels. It's, you know, India is, is still well behind China uh, on, on many measures. But India has been showing impressive dynamism. Um, it has managed to avoid uh, getting into the kinds of trade fights that China has. Uh, uh, India is not seen by the United States as a strategic threat. So I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not any kind of expert on India, but I do, I'm fairly bullish. I think India does, of course, if, there's, if we have a global trade war, which is what will happen if Trump wins, then that's really bad for everybody, and India will get caught up in it too. But assuming that we manage to steer clear of that, I'm actually fairly bullish on India. Hmm. You're fairly bullish on India. But when I, when I were to ask you about the US-India relationship, over the last two years since Prime Minister Modi had met President Biden in Washington, we've seen very close relations, uh, US investing in the semiconductor ecosystem, uh, on electric vehicles, on clean technology. There are a lot of areas of collaboration. Do you see U.S. companies significantly diversifying, looking for alternatives to China, probably even moving out of China and coming to India? Do you think India will be oh. a beneficiary of the U.S. partnership? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's just uh, China does not look like a safe place to put your money. Uh, 
it doesn't look like a safe place to visit, to be honest. Uh, so, no, this confrontation between the U.S. and China, ask who can step in there and on some things, you know, there's a uh, sm much smaller countries are, are actually benefiting. Uh, Vietnam has been doing very well out of this, but, but India as well. India is a, an up and coming emerging market with a lot of potential and which is not, uh, and it, not having a cold war with the United States. Right. Uh, my final question uh, to you, uh, Mr. Krugman, would be about the two wars that we find ourselves in. There is a Russia-Ukraine war, and we're seeing a massive war in the Middle East, which refuses to die down. How do you think, in case we see U.S. getting dragged into a direct war with Iran, and the possibility is there, because Israel is going to retaliate against uh, Iran for uh, the missile attack that had been carried on, how is this going to weigh down the U.S. Uh, economy, the global economy? And do you think either of the candidates, be it Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, would be ready to support such a war? Oh, boy. I mean, the whole a, a lot depends on just how Israel conducts itself. I mean, a, uh, uh, Israel has a lot of support in the United States, but Netanyahu, not so much. And if Israel was willing to show some signs of being, you know, willing to to uh, to relent a little bit on the awfulness of the war, it's going to be horrible regardless, then, then maybe the U.S. will back it. I don't know. Uh, Ukraine, uh, the fate of Ukraine depends on the election. I think if uh, if Harris wins, Ukraine will continue to receive support. And it seems quite likely that in the end, um, uh, sheer attrition will bring an end to the Russian war there. But uh, if, if Trump wins, then uh, then Putin will be in Kiev in a few months. So it's, it's a... Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the whole Middle Eastern thing, it's, I actually uh, am thankful that I don't need to write about it because it's, it's such an awful situation. Right. Uh, one can uh, definitely imagine, and it will uh, have a ripple effect uh, on all uh, aspects of the economy. And finally, you're often asked this question, looking at the uh, way the markets are across the world, what, according to you, are some of the uh, good investment options for... Uh, retail investors across the world at the moment i'm never any good at that i'm not not good at at, uh, at doing these kinds of calls i mean it, there are things that i there are things that i'm i'm bad i i do think that there's an ai bubble so i would say you know probably steer clear of that um i think uh there's uh, definitely uh, a crypto bubble uh, but in terms of what's actually good uh I don't know. I think I, I would be looking for, you know, kind of uh, pedestrian, unglamorous stuff that serves what is still a very, very strong U.S. economy. All right. Uh, good note to end on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Krugman, for joining us, giving your analysis on the U.S. election and where we're headed, uh, depending on who wins the big U.S. election. India is watching out very closely, and we hope to have you again on uh, Global Eye and CNBC TV 18 soon again. Good to be on. Thank you. We're heading into a short break at this point, but coming up, Israeli Defense Forces have killed Yahya Sinbar, the alleged mastermind behind the 7th October attack on Israeli soil. A discussion with Doron Spielman, international spokesperson of the Israeli Defense Forces, when we're back.